Welcome to my new series, Dan in a Van, where I'm going to talk about various things musical and basically just give you the lowdown on what I do and how I go about it. Now, I'm going to talk today about wedding gigs. Just for the, no, just while I'm here, for the safety conscious, this is the key that runs the van. So I'm just going to put it there on the passenger seats, and that means that I can't move and talk while I'm driving, which is, of course, dangerous and illegal, uh, looking into a camera. So today I was going to talk about wedding gigs. Why wedding gigs? Well, financially, they are the most rewarding to a professional musician. Well, weddings, birthday parties, anything where there is a personal service involved. This is a whole different ball game to playing in a bar or a pub or busking or whatever. Yeah, anywhere else that is a public thing. At a wedding, you are playing for the couple. You are giving them a professional service and everyone that goes goes to the wedding will be there to celebrate with them and also would probably like to dance a bit as well. So you've got to make sure that you get all of that right. And I've been in some bands before where it hasn't really gone according to plan. But with my own bands, when I go out to a wedding, there are a certain strict set of rules that I abide by to make sure that it's all going to work. Now, I have a contract for gigs that I, it's a standard musicians union contract that you can download and then doctor and change the names and addresses and all of that. Now, in that contract are stated very basic things, which lots of people forget about. So things like the fact that you're going to turn up, uh, things like if the wedding with the couple uh, cancel the wedding or something happens that you still get paid a proportion of that fee don't forget when you are saying yes to a wedding that's you know 12 months time you can't take any other bookings you essentially you have to be free on that date so when it doesn't happen uh, there is always a, some sort of recompense to make sure now that's really important to get in in there and it's something that has never been a problem. Nobody's ever contested it. And actually, I've done two weddings, well, been booked for two weddings that have then not taken place. And I've seen the proportion of the money that the contract stated um, both times with, uh, with no problems at all. Don't forget that lots of people who are getting married have got wedding insurance. So you have to look up after yourself. Now, the second thing is how long are you going to play for? Usually we do two one hour sets and that's that's fine. That's standard. Um, sometimes they'll ask you to play for longer, but you put in the contract that an additional fee would be negotiated for that. And then you can set it as a so, certain number, a certain amount per performer. You know, you know, that's fine uh, per hour or part thereof. Um, and occasionally that's happened and, you know, and extra money comes our way. Great. That's fine. As long as everything is very clearly stated in a contract, not only does it make you, does it protect you, but it also makes you look much more professional and essentially you get respected a bit better. You know, when you turn up to a gig where there's no contract and it's cash on the night, yeah, there won't be any food or anything, that, you know, they, they, and they'll ask you to play for longer and get all shirty if you can't play another 20 minutes, all that sort of thing. So it's got to be done right. Now, on the subject of food, you should always put in the contract that there'll be a meal for every band member. And nobody's ever questioned that either. But when that does happen, when you book the wedding, uh, the best thing to do is to get the number of the caterer the telephone number of the caterer or an email address because very often when you get to a wedding and you ask the caterer something they are very stressed a lot of the time even the real good ones you know they've got to get their food absolutely spot on they've got to get it right just as much as you've got to get your music right everyone's got to get their service right so if you make contact with the caterer beforehand it's a lot less stressful now first dance I have a little story where we got, now this is years ago before mobile internet, we got um, a CD given to us at the wedding and that was fine. We had a CD player plum plumbed into the, you know, the PA system and the CD was scratched, completely scratched. 
Luckily, we knew what the tune was and enough of us knew the tune enough that we could play it ourselves. And that's something that we've done ever since. When you get somebody asking whether you're free on a particular date and when you quote your fee and all of that, you should always say, we will learn the first dance for you. Now that, that is a really nice thing to do. Well, for a few reasons. For a start, it's very personal. And secondly, you can make that first dance however long you like. Now, the reason for that is, of course, you'd get the bride and the groom, they would come and dance to start with, and then you could call everyone else onto the dance floor. You say, oh, come and join them, da 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 And you can make that first dance go on for sort of five or six minutes and or whatever. And what that does is it really, it just gives them such a great start to their evening. Now, learning a first dance, frankly, if you've got a few months to do it, it's easy. It's really easy. You just learn the song, you get the chords, and it's done. Now, something else you can do, uh, and something else that we've done, uh, one of the weddings that we played at, they asked for um, Let's Face the Music and Dance. Now, we basically thought, if they've asked for that, it probably means they've got a dance routine worked out. Now, when you hear that tune, if you're a trio, as we are, as we were that night, that's quite a tall order to play. So what you do is you record parts at home, like your strings or your keyboards or other guitars or whatever, so that when you come to play it, you've got a backing track in the through the speakers, the live backing track that you've recorded, and then you can play that tune effortlessly. And actually, <laughs> Ironically, the couple hadn't had a dance routine worked out. They just stood there and listened to us play it almost. But they commented afterwards. They said that was a fantastic first dance. Now, when you do things like that at nice weddings, and I mentioned in one of my other videos that you should only do nice weddings, we got bookings from that. People said, we love what you did with that first dance. Could you play for X, Y and Z? Could you play for our daughter's wedding? Of course we can. So it's these things that are seemingly, well, lots of people think, oh, so it's such an effort to learn a first dance. But if you learn your first dance, which might take you an hour or two at home to learn, and then you put it on, you know, you just listen to it and sing along with it. It's really no effort at all. Nothing, no effort. Now, in terms of setting up, you should always find out what's happening on the day. Now, lots of people think, yes, it would be it would be much better to get there really early to set up so that the couple aren't stressed and, 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 and all of that. But actually what happens is weddings do overrun and they do change on the day. So actually your best bet is to get there when all the speeches are done, everything's done and they're changing the room over or they're changing the marquee over or they're getting the stuff out of the way it's much, much better because then you're not hanging around. You don't suddenly turn up with your van while the speeches are happening and then you, they see somebody wandering about outside with a, you know, work clothes on or whatever. You turn up when the stage is being set up. It's easy then. You don't have to negotiate your way through tables. You don't have to accidentally knock the wedding cake over. I've seen it done. You don't have to do anything like that. You just turn up, you have a clear run and you do your if if you need to do a sound check, then great. Now, sound check wise, it's not necessary to go the whole hog and spend an hour getting your sound right. It just isn't necessary. What you do is you get it right in five or ten minutes you do a line check you f flick all the failures up on the desk you go one two into the mics and you maybe do a chorus of something and that's all you need to do because if there's something that's too quiet or too loud you tweak it and then it's done you can make adjustments and by and large if it's a marquee that's quite an easy thing to do because a marquee would have a higher level essentially capable from the PA before feedback occurs. So if you have any problems with feedback or any sort of rumbling frequencies in a marquee, 
it's fine. You just need to make sure it's loud enough because sound vanishes in a marquee. If, however, it's in a board, uh, you know, in a ballroom where it's wooden floors and plaster ceilings and walls and it's very hard surfaces, you've just got to make sure that you're not too loud. Now, volume level wise, at a wedding, very often you'll get maybe the grandparents of the couple meeting for the first time or they haven't seen each other for ages or family members have flown over from New Zealand or wherever it is. They're going to be able to want, yeah, they want to talk. They want to be able to say, how are you, how are you? And da, da, da. they're going to maybe not want to dance. And that's fine. But we need to be mindful of that. There are lots of wedding bands who are just really, really overly loud for not really any reason at all, other than their own sort of for their own good, for their own sake. Now, I've done a wedding before where we're literally just playing, you know, I've, I've done one before where there's no PA, there's no vocal mic, and you just have your guitar and you sing in the in the room with no mic because the room was horrible. But actually, we had a great time and so did they. And, you know, we've had people come up to us saying that was really good. The level was just right. It was so sensitive uh, to to our needs and all of that. And of course, if they ask you to turn it up, then, of course, you can you can turn it up. So it's very important to get the sound, not only the sound right, but the sound, the overall volume right. You've got to get that right. Now, on the subject of fee, you've got to work out really what you've got to work out a fair but firm and good fee for your services. You've been learning your musical instrument for years and years and years, and you've honed your skill. Maybe you can build learning in the first dance to your fee. But you should always find out where the wedding is and roughly what time of day it is. Now, if it's a Saturday in the summer, that's prime time. That is absolutely prime time. You might get four or five inquiries for that same night. So if you do get an inquiry in, you have to say the fee is this. And what you do is you build everything into that one fee. You don't say, oh, yes, it's this plus this plus this. And the, the, yeah, the PA hire is they're just going to go somewhere else because they don't want the stress of having to having hidden charges. In fact, nobody likes hidden charges at all. When you get when you get a caterer for a wedding, you say, oh, there's menu option A, B and C and the price is this, this and this. And that's done. Fine. You know where you stand. So all transport is built in and uh, everything, everything is built in, the, you know, the gas to run the cookers and whatever it is. So you should always specify an all in price. Now, you've got to find out quite a few things, whereabouts it is, you know, how far away it is, whether you need a hotel. Don't get them to book you a hotel. You find a travel lodge and you just and you build it in, especially if it's far enough in advance, you can get good deals on hotels, that sort of thing. Things like how big the room is or how many guests there are will let you know how much PA you need to bring. And therefore, if you need to hire any in, you've got to build that in. So it is always got to be an all in price. And if you say that's an all in all in inclusive, all inclusive price, essentially, that's a call to action. When you're speaking to them on the phone, say all in, it's that bam. So when you when you do have you know, a, a, you know, a phone call and somebody says it's in wherever you've got to be constantly thinking, OK, it's 150 miles. That's that. Da, 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 da. There's three of us in a hotel. That's be 40 quid each. And you, you're adding stuff up on that phone call because you need a call to action. You need to say the fee is X. We're free. I'll shall I pencil it in on the calendar um, and, you know, we can send you a contract um you know, to your home address, whereabouts, you know, give us your home address. Essentially, I know you should always get, you know, three quotes and go for the cheapest, but is the cheapest always going to be the best one? Well, of course it isn't. If you get something that's, if you get cheap, it's you know, you're just going to get something that's just not as good as you could possibly get. Now, without sounding mercenary, people that are getting married tend to have a budget and they might have got a loan, maybe, or borrowed some money or had some money saved up. 
so they're not necessarily going to be counting too much. So they might pay more for something where if they were, hadn't saved up for it, they couldn't possibly afford it. And you've got to you've got to be mindful of the fact that if you get really good gigs, really good weddings, they're only ever going to lead to ones that are as good, maybe better ones, but you're not going to get worse weddings off it. Now, the other thing with money is that people that spend good money on a wedding tend not to tell everyone about it. Whereas if you, somebody's got a bargain for something, they're going to blurt to their mates that this band goes out for this. You don't want to end up in that situation because then, you know, you, you can just essentially not get gigs if you if you've specified if somebody has blurted out to somebody what they've what they've uh, got the band for. So you should be wary of offering special offers on the phone. Unless, of course, it's a Friday wedding, perhaps you say, oh, as it's a Friday, because Saturday, usually our fee is X. Because it's a Friday, we can go out for a little bit less. That's fine, because that is, you know, it's supply and demand rather than the wedding band being cheaper for the sake of it. So you've always got to say, well, because it's X or whatever, uh, you can have, uh, you know, well, there's no hotel because it's so local. You know, think about it. You don't want to be driving miles and miles and miles to do weddings you want to get work locally that would be the best bet really now in terms of things like how you present yourself um you should always be suited and booted for a wedding never turn up in you know black jeans and a shirt or unless the the dress code specifies and so that yeah they might say oh it's smart casual just turn up in what you like of course, but by default, you should always be suited and booted, have your suit in the van, get changed while you're there. You know, ask for somewhere to get changed because that's also, that's, you know, that would make a client think, oh, okay, they, they want somewhere to get changed. It's just a bit more of a service rather than a, you know, a, if you don't ask for these things, you won't get them. And people think, oh, OK, you know, I wonder how good they are as a band. If they've asked for this, this, this and this, then great. Don't ask for free booze because that just doesn't make things look very good. Um, but if you could say, oh, could we have some you know, soft drinks or whatever? That's that's a bit that's a better thing to ask for. So the food should be in the contract, but soft drinks, you could say, oh, might you have any soft drinks available or you know some bottles of water perhaps wedding wedding couples that say or well, where can we come and see you no you shouldn't do that you should not do that at all you should say well here's a youtube link um and it should be ideally a wedding video a, a video of somebody else's wedding now you should always specify on the contract that you reserve the right to have of a recording made because if you get it right and the crowd is up and it's a really nice looking wedding you're going to get the gig that's it's plain and simple but if it's where can we come and see you and you say oh well we're playing at this pub on such and such it just clouds it to this the boundary is very you know the lines are very blurred there and they say oh well they're playing in pubs as well they come mm, i suppose you're only going to get people who maybe somebody who wants a really good band for a wedding is not going to want to go to a pub to see that band you know that stands to reason so what your answer should be well we only do private gigs a few of us might play in the odd pub band just for a few extra quid now and then you know you should distance yourself from pub gigs not to say that pub gigs are bad because we all love doing pub gigs if they're in the right pub and you have a nice time and you know, can have a laugh and that sort of thing. And of course, the pressure's off. But if a wedding band, wedding couple come to see you at a at a pub, you've got to really, really be a bit on your guard. You have to specify your price. They might say, well, what are you getting in here? And I've had that before. You think oh, these are two separate things, but how do you say how do you say that without thinking that you're ripping them off? So it's best avoided if you can. Just say, "Oh, we're we, we're not playing uh, we're not playing in public anywhere uh, near there." 
just say that and just say you play in other bands just for bread and butter work or just pay bill paying pub gigs so there we are i hope that that has given given you a, a sort of food for thought we all want better gigs and we can all get better gigs not only obviously you have to be good at your craft you have to be a good band a good music good you know, bunch of musicians but you also have to have a lot of other things that aren't the musically related you have to be thinking from a business point of view and trying to sell your services